So you are interested in Microtik and you want to start your journey. So where do you start? Well, I'm hoping this video can help you on your journey just to explain a bit who Microtik is or what Microtiks are, how we can use them. And I'm also actually going to show you in a real setup lab how to configure a Microtik for some basic internet access. Now, this should be a great starting point for anybody that's new to the field. This is definitely not aimed at professionals, but I feel like I wanted to start an updated guide um, that's using RouterOS version 7, which released last year, December, and it's really matured a lot since its release. So I do feel like it's time to start making content on it. So welcome. I am the Network Bird. You can also call me Johnny if you'd like. And let's jump into a small presentation. And then afterwards, we'll quickly go over the lab and set up a marketing. So let's have fun. So who or what is Microtik? Now Microtik is a network vendor or manufacturer. They are based in Latvia and Europe. Their headquarters is in Rika and they were started in 1996. Now <laughs> that is the, the minor details I say, because for me, Microtik is also a big solution. It is a router, so many times you will hear me talk about logging into a micro tick or a tick, and it's also commonly referred to as just a micro tick. So if you work on a router board or a CCR, many times you'll hear people in the industry just say they're working on a micro tick. Now, they do develop and sell various different types of wired and wireless equipment. I wanna stress that point as well, because many people have this misconception that micro tick is just for wireless services like setting up stuff like point-to-point -point links or whatnot, which couldn't be further from the truth because they make amazing routers and amazing switches and their wired networking is just as much a part as the wireless networking. For me personally, I love the wired networking even more because I run a whole ISP network off of the wired networking and it works perfectly fine. Now, Microtik also develops and maintains their own operating system, which is known as Router OS. It is based off of the Linux kernel and it's gone through various changes and upgrades. They've actually recently released, well, when I say recently, it's almost been a year. So back in December, 2021, they released RouterOS version seven, and here we are. And the earliest build of this actually was developed to be run on x86, or more specifically, you could put it on a disc, install it on a computer, and then return this computer into a let's say a router, but it wasn't officially a router board yet. Only a few years later, I think 2002, 2003 ish, they actually started producing their own hardware known as router boards. And from there, the rest is history. They started just making their own stuff and it's been amazing since then. So let's say fundamentally Microtik has been making their own hardware for almost 20 years, which is huge. So they're not new to the game. They've been in it a long time already. Now I want to stress a Microtik to fit you. Now, what does that actually mean? It means that Microtik has a solution for everybody. It's not just for ISPs or large enterprises or businesses. It's for anybody that you can think of, even home users. They've got you covered. They, they make spe special access point slash routers known as HAPs or HAPs, uh, a house AP, I guess you could call it. Uh, they make router boards and they make stuff like the CCRs for your data centers and your ISP. So it's not limited to a specific niche. It's literally anybody you can think of. Now, one thing that I really find amazing of Microtik is all of the devices have the same feature set. So from the biggest router that's there to serve the data center to the smallest access point, if you log into it, everything looks the same. How you configure it is the same. There's no weird changes. So how you set up IPs, do the routing, set up firewall rules, all of the features are there and it's the same. So that is pretty crazy. So you can even set up stuff like BGP on a, on a, on a HAP device, even though I would recommend not doing that, but the option is there. And especially if you just want to learn and study, that's actually quite nice. Now I do make a point of mostly all devices have the same features. Reason being you either have hardware limitations. So maybe a small HAP won't be able to obviously handle stuff like a full internet routing table, but on the same point, there's some new features like zero tier or containers that really needs new hardware that needs that arm or arm 64 architecture in order to function so it's not there for the older generations even though you can run router os version 7 on any microtik basically 
the some of the new features you might have to buy a new MicroTik for. Just laying it out there. Now, also a nice thing is it is very affordable for all of the features that you get. So it's not like the cheapest thing, but it's also not as expensive as some of the competitors. Now, what, I, what do I mean by that? Well, if you actually look at the feature set that you get with MicroTik and you compare it to a competitor and find a device that does roughly the same as the MicroTik, it typically comes down to like a tenth of the cost for a MicroTik. So it's definitely the cheaper option to go for. And MicroTik can also be brought into the cloud or on virtual machines using x86 or CHRs, which is actually quite nice as well. So it's also thinking about SDNs and you know cloud-based networking. It's not just the physical plane anymore, which is also good. Now here I've got a list of the feature set. Now I'm not going to read each and every little feature that MicroTik has. I know some of these features are actually missing as well because I copy this from Microtech site, but I know they've added stuff like LDPv6 and uh, WPA3 they've been working on and it's not in here, but I just want to stress the core features. It does routing and you can do stuff like BGP, you can do stuff like VRF is there, OSPF is there, uh, BFD is supposed to be there, but I'd, I'd say they're still working on that for router S version 7 and just a ton of different core features. You've got your firewalling and it is a stateful firewall. You can allow and drop certain things. You can set up a uh, layer seven. I think one of the, the biggest things that I love about the firewall on MicroTik is actually its mangle functionality. Now that sounds weird, but with MicroTik, you can actually change stuff with the packets as it transits to change how it actually flows through the network or change certain details in it which is really powerful there's very few devices that allows you to actually do that type of let's say transformation with a packet as it's already flowing through the network we also get stuff like mpls definitely for your carrier grade stuff many different vpns are supported on it so you get stuff like open vpn ipsec new stuff like WireGuard and zero tiers on there. And you've also got simple tunnels like IP tunnels and they've got proprietary stuff like EOIP. Um, your wireless is there. As I mentioned, some of the new devices have stuff like Wi-Fi 6, which is awesome. Um, you've got your QoS, so quality of service. So you can actually tune how you want traffic to be flowing around the network or how fast certain services can work. Really interesting. Uh, we've got hotspot functionality, we've got DHCP services, so you can configure it as a client or a server. Um, you've got proxy tools, you've got specific different tools on the MicroTik. It even has a bandwidth test server built into it, so you can test what the actual speed is between two MicroTiks, which is awesome. You've got additional features. There's stuff like VRRP that you can configure for that hardware redundancy if, if something fails. We've got STP, RSTP, bridges, really so many different key features. And I'd highly recommend you go to the link at the top of this presentation, help.marketing.com forward slash docs, forward slash display, forward slash ROS, forward slash software plus specifications so that you can go through the complete list yourself and just see how many features you get because now we're going to actually go into what makes router is so special and there's many different things that do but the last point i want to stress but it is loaded on all routers it is the backbone of managing and configuring the network so it is in essence what is powering your equipment so router is is very important People love it because there is a wide array of different management options. So you're not just limited to the command line or with some front end like many other vendors. You get to choose how you want to manage your devices. You've got stuff like if you want to do quick configurations, you can use Webfig. We will just go into your browser, type in the IP of the router, connect to it, configure it that way. Or you can get an awesome GUI, namely known as Winbox. It's an additional application that you can download from Microtech's site and it works amazing. There's so much that you can see and do on Winbox and it comes with so many additional tools built into it, stuff that allows you to connect to routers even over layer two. So you can connect on a MAC address to a MicroTik that doesn't have an IP, uh, that blows my mind because you can manage it even without an IP just using the MAC address or there's even uh, additional protocols like Romon that you can use, which is basically like an overlay management network that runs over layer two, so that if you connect to a device that uses Romon, you can actually see all the devices in that Romon network and connect to any of them, which really makes it 
so so awesome and Winbox allows you to do that and then lastly if you want to do the good old tried and true look like a hacker look like neo then you can use the command line interface or the cli with any terminal client there's even a terminal built into winbox if you want to do that route but you can use stuff like putty or secure crt or whatnot connect to it on ssh or talnet even though i highly recommend connecting over ssh and manage your device that way now here is the big point I want to stress, and I really think this sets marketing apart worlds from other vendors. Now, you saw how big that feature list was and how it runs off of any device. The licenses for all of the devices, when you buy it, you own that device and you own the license. And the license is perpetual, means it never goes away. You don't have to worry about renewing the license. You don't have to worry about anything. The moment you've bought that device, you can do BGP on it if you want. You can do OSPF on it if you want. You can do the firewall rules on it if you want. It's not going to go away after three years and then you need to pay out some more money just to extend the licensing. It's your device. Do with it what you want. And that is really awesome. Now, here's another big point. Microtech and their certifications are also internationally recognized. Now, this is a little bit of a niche thing because this depends on finding companies that actually uh, looks at marketing certifications, but I think it's also a good basis to show you or show maybe other companies that you know how networking works or you know how specific concepts works because you've been certified in that. Now, marketing offer stuff like, let's, let's say the MTCNA, which is the baseline standard certification, which broadly goes into all aspects of marketing. It's very similar to a CCNA or JNCIA. And then from there, you've got your different tracks that you can go into. Want to do wireless? Well, you can do the wireless engineer. Want to do switching? There's a switch engineer. Want to do IPv6? There's stuff for IPv6. Want to spe specifically look at routing? You can go for the MTCRE. And then after your MTCRE, you can even go for the MTCINE, which in essence is there for people that want to go in depth and learn more about BGP and MPLS and stuff like that. And this will more or less be for those top end engineers that want to peer with internet exchanges or actually run the backbone of a network. And I'd say it's definitely similar to something like a CCIE, even though it's not the CCIE, but it's internetworking engineer. So you're definitely going to be, let's say the top dog of the network when you get that. But the options are there, this different certification tracks. And I highly recommend learning more about the training. You typically attend just a small boot camp for the training so you'll find some an organization that's holding the training and then you just go to the training session it's usually a couple of days at the end of the session you write an exam you pass your exam get certified valid for i think three years and then you you'll have to go rewrite your exam afterwards so let's continue we're actually done with i'd say the presentation side i more or less want to talk about some of the getting started bits because let's say You've bought your new Microtech, it's in a box, you just brought it home, you want to start it up and start playing around. How are you going to go about it? So depends on how you want to connect everything, but by default, all router boards come with a default configuration, which is basically just a quick config where they've already set up some basic firewall rules. They've bridged all of the LAN ports together. Um, they've set up stuff like DHCP server for the LAN and they've set up a DHCP client on the WAN interface, which is typically Ether 1 on a router or a router board. So it's just a quick and easy plug and play type of solution. You can even plug this into your current router or home solution and it should in theory just start working as long as your home router issues out DHCP. Now, as I already mentioned, Ether 1 is your WAN connection. And I want to stress that it is important because because of that default configuration, Ether1 will also automatically block all incoming admin traffic. So you will have to connect your own computer or machine on one of the other ports. So two, three, four, five. If you have more ports, any of the other LAN ports so that you can actually manage the device and log into it. And for that initial configuration, it is highly recommended that you do download Winbox to get into the router board so that you can just do the quick setup from there. Afterwards, you can choose your preferred method of configuration, but I typically use Winbox because it is an awesome GUI and we'll just be using it all the time, really. Now, I just want to give you the basic setup example because this is my setup that I will be using. So I will have my intranet, 
my internet will be coming into my current router. So this is just a very small little Zyxel. And this Zyxel will then in essence be issuing out DHCP to my MicroTik on Ether1. So I will connect onto Ether1 and I will have my, even though I say laptop here, it is an actually actuality my computer. So I'll connect my computer that looks like Ether3, but currently it's in Ether2. So this is going to be the basic setup, but I'm not just going to show you the DHCP side. I'll give you a few different setup examples or situations as well, like how to configure a static IP or how to set up something like a triple PoE connection. But all of the other setup bits roughly remains the same. I will also show you the default configuration first, but afterwards we will then just remove that default configuration and then we'll set everything up from scratch because I do feel like if you really want to learn Microtik, the best way to do that is to actually configure the device yourself. If you're just relying on the startup script all of the time, it's going to be difficult when you actually need to get into a situation where you need to set things up. So I highly recommend it's good practice. If you ever need to set anything up, set it up yourself, type in the stuff yourself. You'll thank yourself for it later. Anyways, this is where we're going to wrap off the presentation. Let's actually get into the lab side of things. So for this, we will just start off by actually downloading Winbox. All right, so I've started and I'm on the Microtik website. So first thing I'm going to do is go to the software. And then from the software, we can just click on the Winbox and then you can select your version. Typically it should be 64 bit for most people, but if you have a 32 bit uh, Winbox, then that's it. Let me just also save link as, I'll quickly just save this on my desktop so that it's easily accessible so you can see what it looks like as well. But typically you'll see it's this little bluish icon that looks like a little satellite dish in the middle. I've also got it on my toolbar here, but if you double click on Winbox, it will open up the application and this is what it looks like. So let me just maximize that. Now from here we can see manage, then it tells you what to connect to, login, so what is the username? By default, all Microtix use admin as the username and the password is blank. However, with RouterOS version seven, which is what all of these new videos are based off of, once you've logged in the first time, you need to set the password to something else. Now, how are we going to connect to the Microtik if we don't have any details? Well, we can navigate to this neighbors tab and then from neighbors, the Microtik has actually picked up what the neighbor is. So I can just click on its MAC address here and I can click on connect. And now it's going to tell me, hey, there is a default configuration running. It will give you a little bit of advice like changing the password, upgrading the software packages, enabling the firewall on untrust networks, or set your country name to observe wireless regulations. And then just a few additional information like what the IP address is for the LAN, how the Wi-Fi has been configured. Now, if you want to remove this script, you can just click on remove configuration. It will then basically just do a uh, reboot of the Microtik and it will boot up without any configuration. And then you can set everything up yourself, which is what we'll do just now. But let's just hit OK and actually see what the Microtik has done. So here you can see it is asking us for a new password. Let me see if I can also just zoom in a bit here. There we go. And let me just maximize the screen. So old password, there was nothing. New password, I will just set this to TMB123. I'll click on change now. And now we have a Microtik ready to be configured. It's actually already working because this computer is already connected to the Microtik and it already has internet access. Now I think it's worthwhile before we configure anything or look at any configurations, Let's just talk about Wimbox because as you saw, we logged in and it's given us this nice front pane that we can go through different configuration objects. Now, Microtik even has stuff like a quick set, which is just a quick setup of certain settings. I typically avoid using stuff like quick set or even the default configuration personally. Um, I think again, it is best to configure everything yourself because it gives you just that better understanding of how everything's been put together. But with your Winbox, you've got these different options here to either do something with the session, you can see stuff with the settings, or you can add some stuff to the dashboard. And with the settings, there's also some quick keys, like I zoomed in and out. So control minus is zoom out, control plus is zoom in. But it's nice with the dashboard that you can add extra, let's say widgets to see exactly what's happening with the system. Because maybe you wanna look at the time, so I can add the time, I can add the CPU to see what the current CPU load looks like. 
I can add the memory to see what the memory load looks like and even the uptime. So now you can see how long this MicroTik has actually been powered on, which is quite nice. All right, so if we look at the WinBox in the left-hand side, we have this nice window, which is basically different options that you can configure on the router or things that you maybe want to look at. So we could look at the interfaces of the MicroTik, and if I just click on that, we can then see a representation of the physical interfaces, namely Ether 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. We can even see the wireless network card or adapter on here and we can see something known as a bridge interface. Now a bridge, I just want you to think of a bridge as a way to bundle ports together, put them in the same bridge, and when they're in the same bridge, they can actually operate on the same broadcast domain as well. Now this is very useful because maybe you don't have a switch, but you want all of your devices that's plugging into those LAN ports of your MicroTik to be in the same network. If you bridge them all together, they're in essence in the same network. It's kind of like creating a switch in your router, which is, crazy now if you want to do anything with an interface you can just double click on it and you'll actually first start off in this general tab here you can give the interface a name now i think it is highly advantageous to give your interfaces names so maybe you could make ether one and then underscore or maybe make brackets or something just to give it a description of what it is so this is like ether one is my wan or internet or something just so it's easier for you to get an understanding if you ever forget what a port was configured for or why it's there. So let me just apply this and then you will see that change actually re reflects in Winbox and works great. So this bridge, we can also rename this if I wanted to, to LAN. Oh, the interface list already. So let's just call this local maybe. There we go. So all my local ports, which is two, three, four, and five are now local. And we know that ether one is now for the internet. Now, besides just changing those details, you can also look at stuff like the statistics. And one statistic that I really like, and you can definitely see this is an old router board since this only runs at hundred megabits, um, is from here, you can actually see how much traffic is passing over this link. So if we go to this traffic tab, and you can also see it in Winbox in real time. There's your TX and RX. So this also gives you a nice representation of what's currently happening on the interface. And if an interface is maybe maxing out, if you've got like a 10 or 100 megabit link or something, and you see that link is consistently hitting that, cap that capacity, that ceiling, then you obviously know that you're going to experience some, some network issues, which is a great time to like run a torch tool and I'll Post a link to Microtech's video for it. They, they added a nice video on Torch recently. So something to look out for or forward to. Now that we've looked at the interfaces, let's actually see what that setup script has set up. Now, in essence, what it's done is it's created a bridge. And with this bridge, it's bundled. If we go to this port tab, it's bundled all of these ports together into this bridge so that they function as if they were on the same switch. That's one thing. If we look at our IP addresses, we can see that a dynamic IP address has been picked up on Ether1, and that is 192.168.1.47, which is basically an IP that was issued by the DHCP server, the other side, and this is what's going to be giving this router internet access. Now, if you see this def conf comment anywhere, that's just a default configuration object that Marketic added, so that's what that is for. And we can see that this IP 192.168.88.1/24 was added to that bridge interface. So you, if we're running a bridge, you're going to bind an IP to the bridge, not to a specific interface. Just something to take note of. Let's close this address list. Now, other things that was configured here, if we go into IP, I know that the DHCP client was set up on Ether1 to actually obtain the IP address and give internet access out. If we double click on this, configuration we can actually see here's the interface here it's set to use the peers dns and ntp and it's also been set to add a default route now that is important because if i go into ip route or routes we can see that there is a dynamic route out to the internet and we can see what the gateway is and it is because of that dhcp client configuration all right and if we look at the ip dhcp server so this is where the market has also been set up as a server we can see there is a DHCP server called DEFCONF. We can see what the network is that was configured as well as what DNS servers are being sent out. 
and we can look at any leases. So here I can see that my computer has obtained the lease already. And this is how long this computer has been connected to the Microtech, which is nice. So let's go into the firewall. So I'm going to go into IP firewall. And now we can see a list of predefined rules that have been set up on this Microtech to allow access and to basically get to the internet. Now, there's only, what, 11 rules that have been configured here, technically 12 since zero is also a sequence. One very important thing to note with the firewall, all of these rules are sequential, and what that means is the firewall will read the rules from top to bottom, and then if any, let's say, match is made with a rule, then it will action it, and if no match is made, it will just leave, because this is a router at the end of the day. Now, we can see that there are some rules that will drop certain traffic. Now, this is quite important to note, especially if you're using this default configuration of the Microtech, because many times on some videos that I make, like for stuff like WireGuard or um, some type of IPsec connectivity, people will tell me, hey, they're having some issue, they can't connect. And plenty of the times, the reason is because the Microtech's default rules is set to drop that traffic. So very important to note that if you're going to be using the default configuration, then you're going to have to add additional firewall rules to allow certain things, especially if you want to use stuff like WireGuard, and then you need to allow that type of traffic. I also want to have a look at this NAT tab because the NAT is quite important because this is actually what is masquerading our traffic out to get to the internet. So that our private IPs are actually masked or hidden behind our public or our WAN IP address. So if we double click on this, we can see this is a source NAT. It is set for anything that's leaving out of this WAN interface list. It could have also just been the WAN interface. And then the action's just been set to masquerade. Now this is a very basic setup. One more thing I actually wanna check out, which I know that the Microtech has set up by default, is the wireless. So if we go into our wireless settings, I can see here is the wireless interface. If we double click on this, we can see what the name is and we can go into this wireless tab and from here we can actually configure the wireless. Now you can set stuff like the band, the channel width, the channel width, you can set an SSID and you can even set the security profile. Now security profile is a different tab on the wireless tables where in essence you can set um, if there is any WPA being used or what the password is for this or if there's any EAP certificate. Um, just for your security side of stuff, if, if it's just none, then it's an open network, which means anybody can connect, which is very, very risky. I'd never recommend doing that. Please ensure that you always set at least some type of password for your wireless networks. All right, so this is just a basic setup of the Microtech with its default configuration. So what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to wipe that default configuration. So I'm just quickly going to pause the video. I'm going to factory reset this device and then we're going to set everything up from scratch quickly. All right, so we're back on the Microtech and I have clicked that I don't want the default configuration. So this is now just a blank Microtech. If I look at, let's say the IP addresses, we can see there's nothing configured here. If I look at my DHCP server, nothing's configured. Great, so we can actually set this up ourselves. The first thing I recommend doing is going into my interfaces and I'm just going to name my interfaces some stuff so ether1 again we'll make this our internet and then ether2 that i'm not going to give any name but first thing i want to do is set up dhcp for ether1 so we can obtain an ip address again so what we'll do is set up a dhcp client click on plus select ether1 and I'll say I do want it to use the DNS and the NTP, and I want it to add a default route out. I'll click on apply, and we should actually see this obtaining an IP. So it has obtained 192.168.1.47.24. Now this is great because it should mean that the router has internet access out already. So I can verify this by just opening up a new terminal window. And if I do a ping 8888, you can see, do I have internet out? Yes, I do. So we know that the router has internet, but my computer doesn't have any internet yet. We can see um, if I go to my computer and I try and run a ping out to Google, it is currently failing. Reason being is there is no LAN side configured yet. So let's quickly do the LAN configuration. So what I'm gonna do is firstly set up a new bridge, similar to what the Microtech default configuration did. So I'll add a new bridge 
and this I'm going to call LAN. I'll hit apply. And now I'm going to navigate to the ports. And then with the ports, I'm just going to bind Ether2. I'm going to add that to my LAN bridge. I will hit apply. And another port I might add is my WLAN1. Even though I saw that was disabled, we will fix that up as well. And then if I have the requirement where I add any additional ports, I can just come and add them here as people connect to this router. Or if you really want to, you can pre-configure it. You can add all of the other ports here. So there's Ether3, Ether4, Ether5. And now they are all a part of this bridge. Perfect. So next step for me is I'm going to actually add an IP address. So I'm going to navigate to IP, go into addresses, click on the plus, and let's add a LAN IP address to this bridge. Now I actually like the address of 172.16.0.1 slash 24. That is going to be this MicroTix IP. And the interface I'm going to use is going to be the bridge. If I only connected a single interface and I just wanted that interface to have an IP, I could select that interface here, but we're going to be using our bridge. I'm going to hit apply. Now this bridge has an IP, but my machine still doesn't have any internet because my machine doesn't have an IP address. So to fix that, I can go into IP, DHCP server, and then I can do a DHCP wizard quickly. This is a very quick and efficient way to configure DHCP. So we can click on DHCP setup. It'll ask you what interface. I'll say this is for this LAN bridge. This is going to be the address space. This is going to be the gateway, 172.16.0.1. Addresses to give out. So this is going to be our DHCP pool. So maybe let's just tune this because maybe we have some printers and servers and stuff. So let's just say we only wanted to issue from dot 20. So give out from 172.16.0.20 to 172.16.0.254. Interesting fact with Microtech, it issues the IP addresses from the end to the front. So the first IP it will issue out will be 172.16.0.254. So let's continue. DNS servers. So this is where it's going to set the Microtech as the DNS server. So I'll click on next. And our lease time. So that we might want to set up a bit. So let's maybe make this eight hours instead of 10 minutes. And let's click on next. And there we go. We have configured a DHCP server now. So I should in theory actually be able to obtain an IP. So let's do an IP config. Let's do an IP config release, renew. And then I would like to see in my leases if we actually pick up an IP. You might see that Winbox drops sometimes like this. This is because I'm still connected to this MAC address. It is actually advised to configure on IP once you have set up the IP. So let's quickly do that. Let's connect onto the IP address and we can find the IP as well just by seeing here 172.16.0.1 and I'm going to connect to the IP address now. All right, so now that we're on the router, let's actually see, do I have any internet access yet? So let's just open up command prompt again. And I still cannot ping out and there is actually a very valid reason for that. So if we think about those default rules that were set up, um, if I go into my IP DHCP server, if I look at the leases, I can see there is a lease, so that's good. But I haven't done anything with the firewall yet. So I actually need a masquerade rule in order for my private network that sits in my LAN network to break out via my WAN network. So let's go into our firewall. Let's go into the NAT rules, add a new NAT rule. And this is going to be a source NAT because we're going to be sourcing traffic from our LAN network. And then we can specify the out interface as our ether one. And our action will be masquerade. I will apply this. And now that that's been applied, I can already see some packets hitting this rule. That means traffic's already being natted out. Let's just open up our command prompt and I can already see the ping is working. So ping works. Let's see, does my DNS work? I can ping out to Google. So that is great. And I just want to verify something with the IP DNS settings. So here we can see our dynamic servers is set as 192.168.11. And that is what we've obtained from our device or our upstream. All right, that, that, that's actually it. 
So that is how quick and easy it is to just to do some basic configuration. Here's a few add-ons or pro con tips things I can make. Firstly, I highly suggest making sure that you create an additional user for your Microtik. So for that, I would recommend going into system, going into your users, create a new user, maybe make it your own name, maybe make it something else. Um, so I can maybe make this TMB admin. Reason being, if anybody can get a hold of your Microtik so they can connect to it remotely, the default admin account, every hacker is going to try admin, all right? But if you change that name, at least it's something that they won't just have. So create a new account, give it full access. And what's nice is you can set it allowed from addresses so only specific sources can connect using this account. But I'll leave this as any for now. And then we can just set our password. So I'll make this TMB123. I'll apply this. And now that I've applied this, let's actually log out. And let's log back in with TMB admin and TMB123. So now that I've logged in with this new admin account, another thing I recommend is that default admin account, just disable this. So now nobody can use the admin account to potentially brute force their way into this router board uh, or this marketing specifically. Another big thing that I might stress is looking at your IP services. So in IP services, make sure that you try and set your access according to your needs. So if you know you're not going to use the API to manage this device, disable it. If you're not going to use the FTP server, disable it. If you're not going to use Telnet, disable it. If you're not going to use www, disable it. So for me, I typically just like to use Winbox and SSH. A few other things that you can do to just harden your device a little bit is maybe change the SSH port to something else. So maybe 2202. And this is where I recommend using this available from so that people can only connect using SSH from a specific IP. Now I might make this something like um, 192.168.1.0/24, which is my WAN network. And I might make it 172.16.00/24. So only these two networks can access this Microtik on port 2202 for SSH. Same for the Winbox. Again, available from 192.168.1.0 slash 24 and 172.16.00 slash 24. You don't need to add your WAN address, obviously. This is more or less just because I'm connecting to it also from a WAN on my actual network. Um, but from your LAN network, definitely. And if you are an ISP, maybe any of your managed networks that you want to access this device from. So if we apply this, now we've hardened the device at least quite a bit. So only these specified subnets can connect on, on these specific ports. Another thing is maybe just to use your firewall rules a bit more effectively. So let's go into our firewall, so IP firewall. So these rules are very baseline. It's using stuff like fast track just to basically reduce some of the CPU load. There's other videos I have on the channel that explains fast track a lot better and Microtik also does so in some of their mums. So I won't go too in depth in what each and every little thing does. But in essence, what you need to understand is we're going to basically be freeing up some resources by fast tracking some of the packets, allowing only specific packets. And we're also going to be dropping connections from our WAN that wants to get to our LAN if it isn't any type of destination um, connections. So let's add these firewall rules. So what I might do is I'm going to set the chain to forward. And this is also important. There's different types of chains. So you've got forward, input, and output. Now forward is for any traffic that's passing through your router. Input is any traffic that is destined to your router. So your router is the destination. And output is for any traffic that your router is sending out. But we're going to be sending this as forward because this is going to be between our clients. So like my computer and the internet. So my chain is forward. And then what I might do is I can set the connection state to established and related. I'm going to tick those options and I'm going to set the action to fast track connection. I'm going to apply that. I'm also going to set another rule. It's basically going to be the same rule. So the chain is forward. I'm going to set the connection state again to established and related. And I will just accept that, which is the default action. 
And now that that's been set, other things that we can add as well is in our general, we can also say forward and then our connection state is invalid and that we may drop. And then another firewall rule that I recommend is this is again forward. And what we can set this in as is the in interface as your WAN interface. So in our case, that's ether one. And what I can do here is let's just uh, make sure that I get this right because I don't typically add this rule a lot. Okay, the connection state, we can set this as a new connection. So any new connections that's coming in over our WAN port connection NAT state is not destination NAT. So we need to also just specify this exclamation mark. So if it's not a destination NAT, we're going to be dropping that traffic as well. So that is fine. So these four rules should actually give you a little bit of extra CPU usage as well as just protect your network a little bit. But obviously you can fine tune your firewall rules a lot more here where you can add additional rules. So let's see if we can quickly sort out some wireless on our Mikrotik. So for this, I will just go into my wireless tab. Let's just firstly enable the wireless adapter or the wireless card. Then I can just double click on this I can give it a name if I want here, but this isn't your SSID. So let's just go into our wireless tab. Now from here, mode we want to use is going to be AP bridge. Our band, we can select whatever band we want to use. I'm going to use BGN. We can select our channel width. So for this, I might make it 20 slash 40. And our frequency. I'm going to leave this as auto so that the market can decide itself which frequency seems best. I can make the SSID something like TMB-home. Security profile, I'll leave as default. My country, I can set this to whatever my country is. So I will just set that to South Africa. So it can set stuff to my type of uh, mode. I'm going to set this for indoor use and just make sure default authenticate and forward is ticked. I will apply this. And let's just quickly set the password for this as well. So I'm going to change this password or let's just set the mode for dynamic keys. I'll enable WPA2 PSK for a pre-shared key. And then the password, it has to be eight characters. So this I'm going to make TMB12345. I'll hit apply. And now we have wireless access as well. So let's quickly test this and see if it works. I'll just quickly connect from a laptop that I have sitting around here. And let's see if the Wi-Fi actually picks up. Sorry, it's like sitting right next to my table. Uh, let me just disconnect from my current Wi-Fi. There's the TMB home. So I'm connecting TMB 12345. And once that has connected, I can verify by looking at my registration. There I can see I've connected. And also if I look at my DHCP server and I look at my leases, I'll actually see that this laptop has also obtained an IP on the WLAN interface. So great, so now I've got two machines running on my LAN network that has internet access now. So wireless is also sorted out, which is pretty, pretty good. All right. All right, so this is all in the event of you wanting to set up a DHCP type of connection for your WAN. But what if you have a static IP address from your ISP? Well, the setup is relatively similar. So all I'm going to do quickly now is I'm going to disable this DHCP client interface. So I'll turn this off. And let's say we were given an IP by our ISP to configure. So all I'll do is go into my IP address settings. I'll add an IP to my WAN interface. In this case, it's Ether1. And I'm going to use the same type of IP that was assigned dynamically before. So I'll just make it 192.168.1.47 24. I'll bind that to my ether one. Step one done. But do we have internet access? Let's quickly check. Let's see, can I ping Google? No, that's failing. Now, the reason why that's failing is because I don't have any other things set up yet. So let's just add routing. So here we can see our routing table is empty now for a default route. So we need to add our default route. So I'm going to say to get to the internet, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. We're going to use our gateway as 192.168.1.1. I will apply this and let's go down to our command prompt now. And let's see, can I ping out now? Hey, I can ping out now. 
Now it's also worth noting that since we were using the same interface, we didn't have to change any firewall rules because if I go into my IP firewall, I look at my NAT, my masquerade, my out interface is still that internet interface. Because the point I want to make here is, let's say you weren't using a, a dynamic IP via DHCP or a static IP, but you were using a service like triple PoE. The setup is still very much the same. All that you're going to do in that scenario is you're going to go into your interfaces and you're going to add a new triple PoE interface. So if you click on that plus, you can find the triple PoE interface. So I'm going to search for PPPoE client and you can give it a name like who your ISP is or whatever. And you can specify what interface is connected to their equipment. So that is ether one. And with dial out, you can now specify some stuff like what the username is the ISP gave you, what the password is. And this will also in essence work the same as DHCP almost where you can use the peers DNS, you can add a default route. And when you apply that, that will in essence create an interface that will be under your ether one or will kind of be bound to your ether one. And Important to note your firewall rules. You'll just want to make sure that you update that to your triple PoE interface. So like this masquerade rule, my out interface would be triple PoE in this case and, and not ether one because your traffic will technically be tunneled over a triple PoE tunnel and no longer just be straight over an interface. Anyways, I think this video has gotten quite beefy now. There's a lot of information to digest. But this is a very basic way of how to access your router, what Microtik is, how to navigate around using Winbox, and just a very basic setup for a home case for a user. So that you can add IPs, add a DHCP server, add stuff like routes and firewall rules and wireless and stuff like that. So I hope, I really hope the video has been informative. I'd really like to thank you guys for watching. I also want to thank my Patreon and YouTube members for helping support the channel. And I'm really looking forward to creating some more Router OS version 7 guides and videos and tips and such. Microtech has been doing a great job with their micro tips series, but I do feel like I can still show you guys a few more things, even though I really love their videos. Anyways, I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye.